Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. Good evening. Uh, tonight, I would like to discuss a subject that I think doesn't get a lot of discussion. We talk a lot about compassion in our practice. And it is a himsa. Now, we know that in our practice, we cultivate the experience of, of the compassion within, whether we call that metta, karuna, metri. This is something that we realize from within. It's as though we have a treasure chest within us. But of course, a treasure is of no use unless it's shared. That is where ahimsa begins. Because ahimsa is a practice. And of course, we do have the wish that all beings be free from suffering. With ahimsa, we work to develop the habits and cultivate the kind of loving kindness in our daily actions, both within and without. So ahimsa is not about what makes us comfortable with our conditioning, but the opposite. And again, the Buddha referred to uh, this as going against the stream. It, of course, grows out of the realization that we're not separate beings, but all interrelated. And that violence to the one is violence to the whole. Um, I also would like to show how I'd like to focus for a moment on bias and bigotry and how um, this um, is used um, to conform to dominant power structures that do cause suffering to countless beings. When we talk about bias and the defense, the active defense of bias, we're seeing a lot of this, unfortunately, uh, politically today. Um, I think there are two rationalizations that stand out to me. Number one, ironically, is to, do, to rationalize bias is to appeal to fairness and balance. Of course, Fox News, their logo or their slogan was fairness and balance, wasn't it? And the other strategy is denial. Um, I'm going to use transgender bias as an example. Um, a transgender bias can easily disguise itself as an appeal to fairness, can't it? What if boys deprive girls of scholarships. Hmm, that's a problem, isn't it? Now, leaving aside the fact that we're not really discussing boys versus girls here, we're talking about transgender females. Um, the, you know, this what if is a big what if because it's never happened. So what we have here is a, a false equivalence that seeks to emphasize our differences over our common humanity. The abstract notion of something that might happen is more important to us than the dignity, the human dignity of our fellow sentient beings. So the argument um, that, oh, well, you know, we want to penalize people for being different isn't going to fly. So what we do is we argue against those who try to defend them. But um, just to go one further on this particular example, do trans transgender female athletes really have an advantage? Well, not according to the Olympics Committee and any other sports committee that has followed suit since 2015 when the Olympics decided that um, they would just test hormone levels 
and be done with it. A natural advantage though, is really an interesting expression when you consider that you really don't know what kind of struggles this person has gone through. And I would ap applaud such a person for that. But um, that is an example of a false appeal to fairness and balance. So I guess we would ask in this American context, what would Jesus do? Or in our context, what would Buddha do? Well, we already know the answer. He practiced and preached ahimsa. He prioritized the suffering of the weak over the privilege of the strong. As opposed to anti-egalitarian viewpoints, he defied the caste system and the gender discrimination. Um, he was also a defender of the system of government that we would call today a de democratic system of governance, which is something some people don't know. But uh, when the Buddha gave his last speech at Vulture's Peak, he instructed them to model the monastic community after the Vajian parliament. Now, uh, Vaji was the kingdom that he was staying in at the time in Vulture's Peak, at that time when he was, I think, 82 years old, just as he knew he was going to die. And eventually he was poisoned. Uh, it was not the first attempt. There were many attempts to poison him. Um, and that brings me to some of the egregious things I'd like to discuss about those who react against calls for egalitarianism within Buddhism. Um, female monks were subjected to additional rules that no male monk is, and they make no sense. It's contrary to what the Buddha taught and how he acted in bringing women to the Sangha. And additionally, these institutions, the privilege in these institutions means that female clerics and temples don't get the same financial support and they have to live hand to mouth. The disrobing rate, according to Aya Yeshi, who is a Western Tibetan monk, some of you may know her. She points out the disrobing rate for female monks in Tibetan orders is more than double that of Asian monastics at 85 to 95%. Why the discrepancy? Well, because these people devote their lives and give up their material goods to follow a male teacher who doesn't support them. But the problem doesn't end there. The problem begins there because a typical response when people are alerted to this is to push back. And I've seen five examples I'm gonna show you. Number one, like it or lump it. If you don't like it, you can leave. There's another order you can join. Number two, minimize the problem. You're blowing it out of proportion. The message is more important. Number three, defend the abuser. These men are enlightened. They've helped me. Do you want to ban their teachings? Number four, sweep it under the rug. Buddhism does not discuss politics. I'll address that in a second. And number five, the sneaky discrediting attack. Attack the proponents of Ahimsa as ideologues and biased. All right, of course the Buddha did discuss politics very prominently in his advice to several governors and kings. The Buddha, his father was not a king, but an elected or appointed official in a parliamentary system. And the Buddha knew about this. And he had instructed that his sangha be modeled after the 
the Vajin parliament hold regular assemblies, which is democracy and inclusiveness, live in harmony, share their arms, which is socialism, I guess, and respect their elders. In other words, respect those who have knowledge, whether they be health officials, those teachers who have something to show us about how we can have a better society. Very interesting. So no, the Buddha did talk about politics uh, quite prominently and uh, he was living in a highly charged political environment where he would travel on both sides of the Ganges from uh, one kingdom to another as he gained favor with different um, rulers and lost favor. So yes, politics was a part of his life more than it is for you or I. Let's take um, a look at one um, example. Um, of some of the things that the Buddha said in the Mahaparinibbana uh, Nirvana Sutra. Uh, of course, we all know this is the sutra where he told us to strive on, be a light unto yourself. But um, all compounded things must come to an end, strive on untiringly for your own liberation. It's a beautiful, memorable sutra. But what seems to be left out is this advice To the, he gave this advice to, to the, the Vrijis who were just about to be decimated. Their kingdom was about to be attacked and decimated by King Ajitashatra of uh, Magga, Magadha kingdom. He was preparing to wage war on the Vrijis and annihilate them. And um, one of his regents was there at Vulture Peak when he delivered this. And uh, part of the intent of the Buddha was to reach this region and convince him not to wage war. Something that he had done on another occasion once before when his own tribe was wiped out. So, number one, here are the seven questions to show how um, the health of the nation will be as he spoke to this, these people about to be attacked. Did they hold frequent and regular assemblies and were they well attended? This is public participation, inclusiveness. Number two, did the Vajris assemble and disperse from these assemblies peacefully and conduct affairs in in concord, civil, democratic. Number three, did the Vajris proceed in accordance with their ancient constitution and not enact new laws or abolish existing ones? Systemic integrity, constitutional law. Number four, did they respect and honor their elders? And elders? and heed their advice. Factual integrity in media and government. Number five, did they refrain from abducting women and maidens of good families and from detaining them? Gender equality. We, we didn't even get an amendment for that. Number six, did they show respect and, vener and veneration toward their shrines? In other words, their social institutions. Did we maintain the integrity of our social institutions? Did we make proper provisions for the safety and welfare of the Arhats so they would feel welcome in this land? Asylum. So I'm going to leave you with these thoughts and leave you with some 
thoughts about what ahimsa means to us in this day and age and how we are to address topics that are raised to us by people who are done injustice, including those female adherents who uh, have something to say. Thank you very much for your time.